I'm your host, Angela Baracco Eddy. With me tonight is Dr. Rich Dobbin. He is a board certified gastroenterologist with the Sacred Heart Division of Gastroenterology Associates. You can find him at Sacred Heart Hospital as well as the Endoscopy Center on Davis Highway. And tonight's topic is inflammatory bowel disease. We will be taking your calls throughout the program. If you have a question or a comment and you'd like to get on the air, give us a call. The number is 432-7768. Or if you're outside of the Pensacola area, the toll-free number is 1-800-950-2522. Of course, the Endoscopy Center also has a fantastic website. It's www.endo-world.com and that will be on the screen throughout the program as well. That website has a lot of very useful information. It has information about the physicians, the different offices where you can schedule appointments, of course, the contact information. It also has some frequently asked questions and some different links to different places. So if you have something that you wanna learn some more about, check out that website. It's a fantastic one and it'll get you where you need to be. Again, tonight's topic is inflammatory bowel disease. We will be taking your calls throughout the evening. So if you have something that you'd like to get on the air, give us a call. Or if you have a question that you'd like to ask, but you don't necessarily want to get on the air, just let the operator know. And we can certainly jot down that question and they'll bring it to us during one of the breaks and we can answer that question for you without you actually being on the air. That's something that we haven't done too much of in the past, but we're trying it out and we think that that'll be a great addition to the program. So if you do have something that you'd like to ask, but you're a little hesitant about being personally on the air, just let them know and they'll take your question and we can certainly answer that for you as well. We have a lot to cover this evening. Dr. Dobbin, again, it's good to see you. Well, thank you, thank you so for having me. So glad that you're here. Yes, yeah, so you. tonight's topic, inflammatory bowel disease, we're gonna get into in quite a bit of detail in a few minutes, but I always like to start sort of with the basics. So we'll begin with the, the question, what is gastroenterology? And we'll start with that and we'll grow on that one. Sure, sure, so gastroenterology is a field of internal medicine. Uh, that specializes in diseases of the gastrointestinal tract. So anything from the esophagus to the stomach to the small and large intestines. And we also um, take care of patients who have problems with their liver, with the pancreas. Uh, so pretty diverse, but uh, yeah, it's a, a, just a subspecialty of internal medicine with the focus on gastrointestinal, liver, and pancreatic diseases. Fantastic, and I know that one of the things that you probably see a lot of is inflammatory bowel disease. Yeah. Let's definitely. do a, a real brief kind of definition of what is it, and then we'll get into all of the specifics. Sure, so uh, inflammatory bowel disease, there are two major forms of inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, one is Crohn's disease, and the other is ulcerative colitis, and these are diseases that cause inflammation and injury damage to the intestinal tract uh, with Crohn's disease actually occurring anywhere from the mouth to the anal canal uh, and ulcerative colitis is a disease that's just limited to the colon. And there are some specific differences between the two conditions. Uh, ulcerative colitis as a disease uh, limited to the colon usually just causes inflammation involving the what we call the mucosa, the inner lining of the colon, although that inflammation can be very extensive, it can be very mild, and it can vary in the length of involvement anywhere from just involving the rectum, the lowest part of the colon, just above the anal canal, or it can involve the entire colon. Uh, Crohn's disease is a disease that can uh, occur in a patchy distribution anywhere in the gastrointestinal tract. Um, the disease can have various forms, sometimes just involving the inner lining, but it can go deeper into the colon walls and sometimes extend outside of the colon and cause uh, uh, connections or what we call fistulous tracts uh, into other organs and therefore patients can have um, manifestations outside of just the colon. Um, both inflammatory bowel diseases can also have uh, associations with the joints. Uh, so people can get inflammatory changes involving their joints. Uh, sometimes there are skin manifestations that can occur with uh, both of these diseases. Eye problems can also occur. 
they're considered systemic diseases. So even though we deal with a lot of with a lot mm -hmm. of the gastrointestinal manifestations, these diseases are truly systemic and can have effects outside of just the GI tract. So I'm going to get to that in a little bit more sure. detail in just a few minutes, but I want to go back to what are some of the basic symptoms sure. of inflammatory bowel disease? And I know that since it's two different diseases, there might be specific symptoms for each one, but let's talk about kind of overarching what are common symptoms and then we'll branch to which yeah. what symptoms are specific to each disease. Yeah, so generally one of the, the major manifestations of, of both of these diseases is abdominal pain and uh, uh, pretty much alterations in your bowel habits where patients can have problems with diarrhea, sometimes that's bloody diarrhea, uh, they can uh, have weight loss, um, they can, uh, as I mentioned, have some of these other extra-intestinal manifestations. But the hallmark symptoms typically that bring them to come and see mm -hmm. a gastroenterologist is abdominal pain with diarrhea that's either bloody or, or non-bloody mm -hmm. diarrhea. And then a lot of the times if they're going to see their doctors for um, uh, routine checkups, their primary providers, uh, and they complain of some of these symptoms and, and blood work is obtained, mm -hmm. you might start to see some blood test abnormalities that would be indicative of an inflammatory process that's going on and would generally end up resulting in some kind of a referral to come and see gastroenterologists. Which was going to be one of my next questions is, how do you make the diagnosis sure. of one of these conditions? Yeah, so and how do you differentiate between the two? Yeah, so um, when patients are having problems with abdominal pain or having problems with diarrhea, uh, they will have some basic lab work performed. And if those uh, laboratory tests are abnormal, whether it be they have some signs of anemia, low, mm -hmm. low blood counts, or uh, there are inflammatory markers that can be checked in the blood that can be abnormal, that would normally prompt a referral to come and see a gastroenterologist, at which point we do a little bit more history, get into some details, talk about family history and, and things like that. But ultimately, uh, patients would generally end up having some kind of an endoscopic procedure, usually a colonoscopy, because these diseases, uh, obviously ulcerative colitis involves the colon, mm -hmm. that's the, the uh, organ of involvement there. But Crohn's disease, about 70% of patients with Crohn's disease will have some kind of involvement in either the colon, the small bowel, or combination that we can see with the scope. And when we do that colonoscopy, the information that we gather from doing the colonoscopy gives us a better idea of whether it's ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. Ulcerative colitis tends to be a, a continuous disease starting in the rectum and working its way forward or up the mm -hmm. colon, whereas Crohn's disease tends to uh, have involvement possibly in the colon and in the small bowel, but they're, they're called skip lesions. You'll actually see some ulcerations in one area or inflammation in one area, but then you'll have normal looking tissue and then it'll be abnormal and that helps to differentiate so, so you know yeah. we've had some calls come in so I do want to get to the phone and sure. if you're uh, on hold continue to hold we're gonna get to you as soon as we can we've got a few lines holding hello and thank you for the call do you have a question or a comment for dr. Dobbin I got a question I got a friend had ulcerative colitis that they had a, a procedure called a J pouch it's going on 10 years now Will you run into trouble that with the longer you have it, or is that a permanent uh, solution? So ulcerative colitis uh, is a disease that can be cured by having your colon removed. Uh, the disease is limited to the colon, and in some patients that do not respond to medications, uh, surgery is an option for those folks. And surgery can be an option in Crohn's disease also, but it never cures the disease. Uh, but with ulcerative colitis, it can cure the disease. And what uh, uh, surgeons will create is a pouch out of the small intestine that serves as uh, almost like a, a reservoir. It, it becomes uh, like the new rectum for that patient. And they attach that internally to the anal canal. And that um, 
ileal pouch anal anastomosis is meant to be a permanent fixture and most patients live with that for the remainder of their lives you can get something called pouchitis which is inflammation of the pouch and that is treatable but sometimes and this is not a very common thing sometimes if chronic pouchitis does occur then you do have to take that anastomosis apart so that you are no longer connected to the natural anal orifice and then in that instance you might have to create a permanent ostomy which is mm -hmm. a, an opening on the skin that would then drain into uh, a drainage bag but most of the time patients with the J pouch that that surgery is intended to be a permanent fix uh, for their disease and I hope so, that answered your so question much. So yes, it sounds like if it's going well, it should continue to go well and that's right. That's a good thing. So we appreciate your call. Thank you very much for calling in. All right, there we go. So we, um, it looks like we lost a caller. So if you have a question or a comment, give us a call. We would love to get your question on the air. Or again, if you don't want to be on the air, but you do have a question, call in. And that might've been what the other one was doing as well, was leaving a question for us that we'll pick up at the next break. You talked a little bit, Dr. Dobbin, about the colonoscopy, that if someone was um, coming in complaining of these symptoms, that more than likely you would do a colonoscopy. Briefly describe what that procedure is. Sure. I think people hear about that a lot. We talk about screening colonoscopies a lot, but they don't necessarily understand what the procedure is. And since we're going to be talking about it a lot this evening, let's kind of give a brief definition. Sure, sure. So a uh, colonoscopy is uh, an endoscopic procedure that we uh, will generally provide sedation for. Rarely someone will do a colonoscopy without sedation, but that is rare. Um, uh, but it's a sedated procedure where a flexible lighted instrument about the diameter of a, of a person's index finger, maybe a little bit smaller, uh, is introduced through the anal canal and it, it is introduced all the way through the entire colon. So it goes to the area where the small intestine and the large intestine come together. And then generally what you do with during a colonoscopy is it, it's a, a scope that projects an image up on a screen that allows us to see the inside of the large intestine and usually the lower part of the small intestine. And then we do a slow withdrawal and we look for abnormalities in the lining of the colon. It has a little port that we can uh, uh, put devices down to either remove um, polyps or other lesions that we might find or allows us to do tissue sampling of the lining of the colon. Again, patients are generally asleep for this procedure uh, and uh, they don't really feel much uh, during the actual procedure itself although afterwards might feel a little bit of uh, gas in the intestine because of some air that we put in to inflate the colon a little bit. Um, very safe procedure and uh, it's something that we do a lot of for routine screening purposes as a preventive measure to try to lower the risk of an individual developing colon cancer. But in, in inflammatory bowel disease, we use it as a tool to help um, not only make a diagnosis, but to sometimes assess how well our treatment is working for an individual. When we, and I know we'll talk a little bit about some of the treatments, but when we are, are treating people for inflammatory bowel disease, whether it be Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, our goal of treatment is to not only improve their symptoms and their well being, but to heal the inflammatory changes that are present in the colon. And colonoscopy is a great tool that allows us to help determine whether or not we're achieving that goal of, of healing of the tissue. We've got a lot more to talk about. It is time for us to take our very first break. If you have a question or a comment, please give us a call. We would love to hear from you when we come right back with more Health Talk. Our weight, it's with us every day. It's not that we don't try to say goodbye to our excess weight, we do. We exercise, we eat healthier, we try to stay active. But for many of us, it's simply not enough. Well, there's finally a solution. Introducing Orbera, a non-surgical procedure to achieve meaningful long-term weight loss. Orbera is a new non-surgical weight loss procedure that can help you gain the edge and lose the weight. People lost more than three times the weight with Orbera than diet and exercise alone. 
Orpera gives you that edge you need to lose the weight and power a more confident, healthier lifestyle. Orpera is not for those who are pregnant or breastfeeding, have autoimmune or organ disease. Heartburn, stomach discomfort, abdominal pain, and bowel obstruction are rare. Other adverse events include nausea and vomiting. Find out more and see if Orpera is right for you. Has anyone ever said you are the picture of health? You look healthy, you feel fine, but that may not be the full picture. Colorectal cancer is the second leading cancer killer of men and women over 50. It doesn't always cause symptoms, but it can be prevented. Screening can find precancerous polyps so they can be removed before they turn into cancer. Get screened. Make sure you are the picture of health. and welcome back to Health Talk. I'm your host, Angela Baracco Eddy. With me tonight is Dr. Rich Dobbin. He is a board certified gastroenterologist with the Sacred Heart Division of Gastroenterology Associates. And you can find him at Sacred Heart Hospital as well as the Endoscopy Center on Davis Highway. Tonight's topic is inflammatory bowel disease. And we've been talking about that in some detail, but we're going to be getting into it in a lot more detail throughout the program. So if you have a question or a comment, specifically related to inflammatory bowel disease, which includes Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, give us a call. We would love to get your question on the air. The numbers will be on the screen throughout the program, 432-7768, or if you're outside of the Pensacola area, the toll-free number is 1-800-950-2522. So if you have a question, give us a call. If you want to ask a question but don't want to be on the air, call us anyway and certainly you can give your question to the operator and they will get it to us. We did have one come in. I'm going to hold it for just a minute until we get to the right part of the program, but we appreciate that coming in that way. So if you do have one, give us a call. We'd love to hear from you this evening. Before the break, again, we were talking about inflammatory bowel disease and we were talking about some of the specific symptoms and things like that. I want to start off this segment talking about whether or not it's more common in a specific gender a specific race, at what age, or is there an age group at which you kind of notice the onset of symptoms more often than other age groups? So it's kind of three or four different areas there, Dr. Dobbin, but let's kind of hit on sure. that. Okay. So as far as age is concerned, uh, generally we think of inflammatory bowel disease as having a bi, what we call a bimodal age of onset, uh, where uh, there's a, an age group that you, you can start to make that diagnosis anywhere from their teenage years all the way up to roughly around age 40. But then there's a second group of patients that will have a later onset of the disease itself. Um, we generally say somewhere bet starting between the age of 50 to 60 all the way up to about age 80. Although there's some question about the older age as far as whether the diagnosis is actually inflammatory bowel disease or could it be something that is a little bit more common in the older population regarding the bowel, something called ischemic colitis where there's poor blood flow that occurs to a certain part of the colon that can cause a very intense inflammatory change, very similar and sometimes hard to differentiate between inflammatory bowel disease. And so there, there could be some confusion with the diagnosis in the older population, but, but in the younger population, when, when patients present with those types of symptoms that we talked about, and then you do a colonoscopy and you see inflammatory changes, more often than not, that is inflammatory bowel disease. And then, you know, we can do some other testing sometimes to try to confirm that diagnosis. But um, as far as uh, um, male or female, mm -hmm pretty much an equal distribution there. Uh, um, the, the ethnicity, a little bit different. It is more common in Caucasian populations than it is in blacks or Hispanics uh, to see inflammatory bowel disease. That doesn't mean that other ethnicities don't have inflammatory right. bowel disease. It's just more common in Caucasians. And in particular, patients of Jewish descent uh, have a higher risk of developing Crohn's disease um, which, yeah, is uh, kind, kind of unusual, but, uh, but that's been something that's been well documented. Um, there can be a genetic predisposition in some families when a first-degree family member is diagnosed with 
one of the inflammatory bowel diseases. Other first degree family members are at a higher risk of potentially developing those diseases. That doesn't mean you're guaranteed to get it. Like if mom has it, uh, you're not mm -hmm. guaranteed to have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis occur. But if you ever develop symptoms that even raises the suspicion that you could have it when there's a first degree family member, it really makes us a little bit more mm -hmm. hyper acute to that and say, well, we really need to investigate this and run this to ground to make sure that we're not overlooking a diagnosis. There are other types of conditions that you know, can make symptoms similar to inflammatory bowel disease, infections, and even irritable bowel syndrome uh, that, uh, you know, it, when there's not a family history, those might be a little bit more common. But when there's a family history and patients have symptoms, then we really do get concerned about possible underlying inflammatory bowel disease. If a first degree relative is diagnosed with Crohn's disease, or specifically with ulcerative colitis, with either one of those, is it more likely that the increased risk for their children is the same thing that they were diagnosed with, or could it be either one? Could be either one. So it inflammatory bowel one. disease, if they have Crohn's, you might have ulcerative yeah, colitis, exactly it's still right. the same disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, you, uh, it, it, it can be either one. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Is there a genetic test for inflammatory bowel disease yet? Uh, not yet. There's, there, there is some testing that we can do that looks at a series of inflammatory markers, some um, uh, antibodies to certain organisms or other proteins that are uh, considered inflammatory type proteins in the body and, and, uh, and some genetic testing that can be done that is then all taken together uh, mm -hmm. and they, I, I, it's, it's a specific <laughs> lab that, that kind of then says, well, there's a strong possibility that these findings are consistent with inflammatory bowel disease, either Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, maybe can't differentiate. But as far as a single genetic test, that is the inflammatory bowel disease test. That we we don't have that it's yet. Not one yet. Yeah, they're 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 looking at it and mm -hmm. they're trying to come up with a way to be able to test folks for it. But it's 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 not there not yet. Not there yet. Yeah, yeah. We have had a call come in. I'm checking the phone. Yes, we've had a call come in, so I want to make sure that we get to the caller. I'm going to get to you right now. Hello, and thank you for calling. Do you have a question or a comment for Dr. Dobbin? Uh, yes, I do. I am um, listening to what y'all are saying and. I want to give you a kind of real life situation. Um, in my wife's family, um, about 30% of the uh, people in her family have developed Crohn's disease. You know, one uh, sister had it early on, a brother had it, you know, in his mid 40s, and then uh, one sister has had it um, after she's had all her, you know, childbearing, and um, it, she's in her, you know, early 50s. So I, I guess uh, it was a little bit about what you're talking about. It can occur at different times, but um, my real question is: um, my wife herself is she um, still at risk? Uh, she's um, she's in her 60s. So what what would be the possibility of her developing uh, Crohn's disease since she has such a strong uh, family history? And then finally, the last part of my question is: um, the next generation, um, you know, our children and grandchildren. I'll hang up and listen to hear what the doc has to say, okay? Great, thank All you so right, much great, for the question. Great. We appreciate Thanks. the call. So uh, to answer that question uh, in, in the simplest way, um, I think if you have first degree family member who is diagnosed with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, one of the inflammatory bowel diseases, you're, you're never really out of the woods, so to speak, in terms of your risk of, of developing it. Uh, it. You know, as you get older, that risk may get a little bit lower if you haven't manifested it by now, but it sounds like in this particular family, there were some family members that were diagnosed in that second age distribution that we talked about earlier. And so I think that there is certainly a risk that um, your wife could potentially still develop inflammatory bowel disease at some point in her lifetime. And it would be one of those things that symptoms might warrant a more aggressive investigation if 
uh, if it ever came down to that. And I'm going to interrupt for just a minute just to define first degree relatives. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. So first degree means uh, um, a mother, a, a father, brother, sister, sister, or child. Okay. Okay. So there we go. And and uh, and so that's where the the risk of inflammatory bowel disease is highest is when you have a first degree member, uh, first degree family member who is diagnosed and. The, the 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 risk increase is, is is very broad when you look at the literature that's out there anywhere from a three to twenty fold increase of eventually yeah. developing inflammatory bowel disease when you have a first degree family member and I, I would think that there's a higher risk if you have multiple family members mm -hmm. that were diagnosed but as far as the next generation is concerned you have to have that first degree family member get diagnosed so even though your um, children have aunts and uncles that are diagnosed with Crohn's disease, unless mom or dad gets diagnosed, the likelihood of them developing inflammatory bowel disease is might be a little bit higher, but not as if it was a first-degree family member. If the, if uh, the wife ever does get diagnosed with Crohn's disease, then you'd have to think about that, and the children also. That risk is there. So. So it sounds like potentially, if she's in her 60s, it sounds like there's a good chance that she may not be diagnosed with it since it's typically yeah, diagnosed younger. Typically diagnosed younger, yeah. But if you have those symptoms develop, then... You're going to investigate. You're absolutely. going to be very aggressive as far as investigating, yeah. After someone has been di diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease, if they have either been diagnosed with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, you mentioned that the colonoscopy is sort of one of the tools that you use to continue that um, regimen, the, the treatment regimen that you're doing. How often does someone have to have a colonoscopy once they've been diagnosed? And I know it's probably different for every patient, sure, but just sure. sort of in general. So that's a great question. and. Uh, I Not a really it, good answer. <laughs> well, I don't know if there's a great answer because I think a, a lot of people will practice uh, uh, differently. But in general, once a diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease is made, um, and if you put somebody on a particular treatment and they respond to that treatment and you've shown that their symptoms have responded to that treatment uh, for both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, you don't have to keep necessarily doing colonoscopies unless there's a change in their symptoms and you think, okay, maybe my treatment's not working that well, or unless their disease has a lot of colon involvement. So I'll, I'll talk about mm -hmm. each one separately. Ulcerative colitis is a, a, a colonic inflammatory disease that depending on the extent of inflammation in the colon increases your risk considerably for developing colon cancer during the course of your lifetime. And that, that, that risk increases after you've had many years of the disease. And generally, if your entire colon is involved, we say that even if your disease is under great control and you've been on a stable medication regimen for years and years and years, after about eight years of having disease, you need to start undergoing a periodic exams to screen you to see if you're developing any changes in the lining of the colon that might put you at risk for colon cancer. If you have what we call left-sided colitis, which is basically disease on the left side of the colon, so involving the rectum into what we call the sigmoid colon and then the mm -hmm. descending colon, so just the whole left side of the colon, uh, you start that process probably somewhere between 12 and 15 years of, of having the disease. And then you do colonoscopies every one to two to three years, depending on what you find. And in some instances, if you find some worrisome changes, it could be an indication for either more frequent colonoscopies or possibly even surgery to remove the colon. Wow. Um, when you just have disease that's limited to the rectum, the very lowest part of the colon, that does not increase your risk generally of developing colon cancer. And so those individuals 
you don't really need to do those surveillance colonoscopies until they hit the age appropriate time to have mm -hmm. uh, colonoscopies performed just like the routine population. The only time that might change is if they have a worsening of their symptoms and then they would get reassessed mm -hmm. and if the disease has gone from just involving the rectum to involving more of the colon then you sort of reset the clock for them. Now Crohn's disease a little bit different. Crohn's disease if you don't have extensive colonic involvement, mm -hmm. then there's not really any set guidelines that are out there that state this is the exact interval that you should do periodic colonoscopies. Most providers, gastroenterologists, mm -hmm. somewhere at, at maybe every five years might want to take another look on someone who has Crohn's disease. And that's because it's sometimes the, the, the disease itself might be very active yet not necessarily be causing a whole lot of symptoms and you have to, mm. to reassess and just make sure that your your disease is still under reasonable control. Now if there's colonic involvement you treat it just like you would ulcerative colitis and so you would do those same uh, types of intervals. Wow. Yeah. So again it's very specific to to the individual what you, and yeah, yeah. What you yeah. have but, mm -hmm. but a little bit different too I mean there are some different guidelines that's not quite the same as a screening colonoscopy no, every 10 years. No, definitely so. not, definitely not. It's time for us to take another quick break. When we come back, we're gonna talk about some treatment options that are available. And if you have a question or a comment, it's a great time to give us a call. We'll be right back with more Health Talk. It's impossible to replace anybody that you love. She was my, my great role model, my Grammy Keaton. It was pretty much of a shock for us when she got colon cancer. We were, none of us were prepared for that. Here's the deal, and, and this is the bottom line here. Colorectal cancer is the second leading cancer killer of men and women over the age of 50. And you know what, this is one that you can prevent. Just get screened, okay? I know how precious life is right now. We can all do this. You can do it, I can do it. I can do it, you can do it, okay? How's that for a deal? Our weight, it's with us every day. It's not that we don't try to say goodbye to our excess weight, we do. We exercise, we eat healthier, we try to stay active. But for many of us, it's simply not enough. Well, there's finally a solution. Introducing Orbera, a non-surgical procedure to achieve meaningful long-term weight loss. Orbera is a new non-surgical weight loss procedure that can help you gain the edge and lose the weight. People lost more than three times the weight with Orbera than diet and exercise alone. Orbera gives you that edge you need to lose the weight and power a more confident, healthier lifestyle. Orbera is not for those who are pregnant or breastfeeding, have autoimmune or organ disease. Heartburn, stomach discomfort, abdominal pain, and bowel obstruction are rare. Other adverse events include nausea and vomiting. Find out more and see if Orbera is right for you. Welcome back to Health Talk. I'm your host, Angela Baracco Eddy. With me tonight is Dr. Rich Dobbin. He is a board certified gastroenterologist with Sacred Heart Division of Gastroenterology Associates. You can find him at Sacred Heart Hospital as well as the Endoscopy Center on Davis Highway. Tonight's topic is inflammatory bowel disease, and we've been talking about that in great detail for the first half of the program. We're going to continue talking about that, but we'd like to hear from you as well. If you have a question or a comment, give us a call. The numbers will be on the screen throughout the program, 432-7768. Or if you're outside of the Pensacola area, the toll-free number is 1-800-950-2522. We also would like to get your question if you don't want to be on the air. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask, but you don't want to ask it yourself, then give us a call and ask the operator to bring us your question. And we had someone do that in the last segment, so we got the question during the break. And I won't go into too much detail about it, but it kind of leads into what we're going to be talking about this segment. And someone was talking, uh, that the caller said that they had developed um, inflammatory bowel disease and they had gone to the doctor, they had got tried some treatments that didn't seem to be working very well, and it actually prevented them from doing some of their traveling. They were a musician, they were traveling on the road, it was hard because the condition was not being very well treated. So they had to quit traveling and touring and things like that. But they have since gone back to the doctor, they've tried some different things, they've worked out a regimen that seems to be a lot more effective, so much so 
that they're going to get back on the road soon. So his point, his comment, I think, was if you're not finding something that's working for you, don't give up. Go back to your doctor and try something different. So, Dr. Dobbin, that kind of leads us right into what I want to sure. talk about this segment and what are the treatment options available and how do you determine which one is most effective? Sure, that's an excellent question <laughs> and I appreciate that phone call because there's no bigger truth than that. What works for one person may not work for another person. Um, the, for years, uh, the, the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease uh, was, was based on providing some kind of anti-inflammatory medicine to the bowel itself. Uh, whether it be delivered to the small intestine or delivered to the colon. Uh, and the, the forms that we used to use way back many, many years ago uh, was a, a topical anti-inflammatory medicine that was gut specific called mesalamine or some other type of 5-amino salicylic acid product. And so mesalamine is the most common one, but there are some other ones that are available and it comes in different formulations and the reason that different formulations were created was because the the mechanism of delivery to deliver the anti-inflammatory medication to different parts of the GI tract uh, were developed and and so different formulations were made to provide different modes of delivery and then we would use steroids uh, on people to get inflammation under control the problem is that mesalamine products are really, really good products for maintenance and steroids are not. They are good for, for tackling inflammation and then knocking it down and then going back to some other form of maintenance therapy. So we then discovered that a, a different class of medications called immune modulators, things that alter the body's, uh, the, you know, inflammatory bowel disease is an, a, a there's a lot of dysregulation in the immune system and in the inflammatory cascade that sets this off. And there are more um, uh, factors involved with gut inflammation and, and maintenance of, of what we call homeostasis in the gut that, that is way beyond what we can <laughs> talk to. And unfortunately, I don't, it, you know, it's beyond that, that we have scientists in the lab that figure all this stuff out. But we know that there's some dysregulation, dysregulation in the immune response to inflammatory markers that occur, and when you can modulate that immune response with immune modulators, it will result in improvement of inflammation. We learned a lot of this from rheumatologists in the treatment mm -hmm. of inflammatory arthritis and skin diseases, and we could start using some of these products in inflammatory bowel disease. So some of the immune modulators were originally designed to get people off of steroids, things like Imuran or azathioprine or mercaptopurine, uh, which is purinothal, or methotrexate or cyclosporine. These were immune modulators that were steroid sparing agents. And then in the past probably 20 years, we've discovered these uh, new agents, biologic agents, mm -hmm. Uh, that you'll see commercials for and and they target um, specific inflammatory mediators in that inflammatory cascade and try to break that cycle of inflammation and the original ones were something called anti-tnf therapies or tumor necrosis factor therapies and um, that's your remicade mm -hmm. and humira and then there's a couple of others on the market uh, uh, Simzi and Simpani that were uh, also out there uh, and designed to um, uh, target tumor necrosis factor alpha and block its effects on inflammation. And the difference between the medicines is that uh, Remicade is an infusible medication, so you come in for IV infusions and the other ones are injectable medications either every two weeks or every four weeks. Uh, some newer products have also been developed that target different parts of the inflammatory cascade, have completely different mechanisms of action, and uh, one is called Intivio, and then the newest kit on the block is Stellara. And Intivio is an infusible, and Stellara starts off as an infusion and then is an injectable form of the of the same medication and these have different targets and they're generally used as a second line agent mm -hmm. if one or more of the 
original biologics are, are unsuccessful in controlling the inflammatory bowel disease. Um, the um, Intivio could potentially be a first line agent now also, but Stellara is definitely one that's, uh, that is considered, you know, after mm -hmm. a certain amount of other treatments are used. And so we've, we've sort of changed our, our paradigm of treatment though now because the mesalamine products, which by the way are actually very good in ulcerative colitis, about 70 plus percent of patients will respond to some form of, of five amino salicylic acid and can get their disease into remission when they have ulcerative colitis. Crohn's disease, not so much. They, the, we, the, the treatment effects, the, the treatment responses were never really that great with those products. Mm -hmm. We still use them because they're safe in general. Mm -hmm. um, but the paradigm for the treatment of ulcerative colitis is, uh, I'm sorry, of Crohn's disease has now changed. And we actually try to get very aggressive with treatment of Crohn's disease because we know that it can be such a debilitating disease in the mm -hmm. long run if you don't get that inflammation under control. And so when we see certain things on a colonoscopy that are predictors of a more severe uh, disease mm -hmm. in the long run, then we will generally go ahead and get aggressive with either an immune modulator, a biologic, or a combination of the two of them to try to get that disease right under away. control, yeah, right away. And sometimes you have to do that with ulcerative colitis also if they have very uh, serious inflammation, very severe inflammation. Sometimes that's the best course of action. There's always the potential you could try to step down to a lesser therapy, but um, I will tell you that most of the time in experience when someone is requiring a biologic or an immune modulator to get their disease under control, it's kind of hard to step down to a mesalamine mm -hmm. product in the long run. Um, but that's that's kind of where we are with uh, with the treatments at this point right now. And there are new biologic type agents that are being developed as we speak uh, that are go, you know are eventually going to end up in clinical trials and maybe someday instead of an injection or an infusible, we'll actually have a pill form of a biologic that can put the disease under. Uh, control. Um, I think we're a little ways off from that, but I imagine it will happen at some point. So You mentioned getting the disease into remission. Yeah. Is this something that will ever actually be cured, or is that something that once you're diagnosed, you will have to treat it That's right. forever? So Crohn's disease, for sure, is not curable. Um, you hope to put it in remission and make it so that clinically you're not having any symptoms and when you put, do follow-up scopes on these individuals, you see no evidence or minimal evidence of active inflammation or disease. But unfortunately, it's not curable. Um, and in fact, when you do surgery in Crohn's disease, as a lot of patients may end up needing, once you do one surgery, your likelihood of needing future surgeries down the road is actually pretty high. And it just keeps happening and happening that way, which is why you try to not do surgery in Crohn's disease right. if you can avoid it. Ulcerative colitis can be cured. The bowel disease can be cured, but it's only cured with removing the colon. It's a surgical cure that, can, that, that will fix that disease. But again, you can live with the disease for your entire life in some instances if you can put the disease into remission. The problem with ulcerative colitis, unfortunately, is that cancer risk that occurs because of having the disease, especially if you don't get that disease under good control and get that inflammation under good control, that risk of eventually developing dy dysplasia, which are abnormal cells mm -hmm. within the lining in the colon, and then eventually developing colon cancer is high. There are some that even advocate it, especially in younger people, and I'm not saying that I advocate this, but it, it certainly is something that you have to have a conversation sometimes with your patients of doing what we call a prophylactic colectomy at some point. If someone's diagnosed with ulcerative colitis at a very young age and they're gonna live until they're 80 or 90, there's a high risk that they could potentially Absolutely. develop colon cancer and there are some that advocate doing prophylactic colectomy on those people as a preventive measure. Wow. Yeah. I, I'm lots not saying I do that. Yeah, yeah. Lots but. to consider, lots of discussions. It's time for us to take our final break. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about how diet might contribute to flare ups or to some of these different things. And we have had another question come in, so we're going to get to that too when we come back with more health talk. Our 
wait. It's with us every day. It's not that we don't try to say goodbye to our excess weight, we do. We exercise, we eat healthier, we try to stay active. But for many of us, it's simply not enough. Well, there's finally a solution. Introducing Orbera, a non-surgical procedure to achieve meaningful long-term weight loss. Orbera is a new non-surgical weight loss procedure that can help you gain the edge and lose the weight. People lost more than three times the weight with Orbera than diet and exercise alone. Orbera gives you that edge you need to lose the weight and power a more confident, healthier lifestyle. Orbera is not for those who are pregnant or breastfeeding, have autoimmune or organ disease. Heartburn, stomach discomfort, abdominal pain, and bowel obstruction are rare. Other adverse events include nausea and vomiting. Find out more and see if Orbera is right for you. Has anyone ever said you are the picture of health? You look healthy, you feel fine, but that may not be the full picture. Colorectal cancer is the second leading cancer killer of men and women over 50. It doesn't always cause symptoms, but it can be prevented. Screening can find precancerous polyps so they can be removed before they turn into cancer. Get screened. Make sure you are the picture of health. And welcome back to Health Talk. I'm your host, Angela Eddy. With me is Dr. Rich Dobbin. He is a board certified gastroenterologist with the Sacred Heart Division of Gastroenterology Associates. And tonight we're talking about inflammatory bowel disease. We've had several very good segments. We've had some great calls and questions. If you have a call or a question, go ahead and give us a call now. It'd be a great time. The numbers are on the screen throughout the program, 432-7768 or outside of the Pensacola area. The toll-free number is 1-800-950-2522. We did have a call come in and I wanna make sure we get to the caller before we get on to our next topic. Absolutely. So I'm gonna try and get to the phone. Hello and thank you for calling. Do you have a question or a comment for Dr. Dobbin? Well, I sure do. I don't have Crohn's or ulcerative uh, colitis. But I'm curious if there's some preventative maintenance you can do before you get something like that. And I'm referring to uh, a high colonic or some sort of thing like that. Would that help? You know, keep this away from you? And I'll, I'll wait for your answer. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, well, I, I think the uh, simple answer is something like a high colonic is probably not preventative for inflammatory bowel disease. Unfortunately, we, we don't really know the pathogenesis of inflammatory bowel disease, whether it be Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. We believe that there is a genetic predisposition in the individuals that have this disease, and it's laying there latent, this, this genetic predisposition, until some kind of an environmental factor unmasks the disease as some kind of a trigger, whether it be something in the diet some Im have implicated uh, some kind of an infection or inflammatory process. Uh, there are other environmental factors that can certainly predispose people to having Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Uh, smoking can be a factor, although interestingly, smoking can be protective against, not that we advocate going out and smoking, but okay. can be protective against ulcerative colitis in some individuals. We actually find that in some individuals who quit smoking, that can un the the quitting of smoking can actually unmask the underlying genetic predisposition That's for ulcerative colitis, exact opposite of Crohn's disease. Um, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs can sometimes increase the risk of developing it. But as far as what the general population can do to prevent it from happening, there really is nothing that we definitely say this is the type of diet or the type of activities or things that you should be doing to prevent inflammatory bowel disease from occurring. In general, we advocate a high fiber diet that's relatively low in fat, uh, but it, that doesn't mean that it's gonna prevent you from getting inflammatory bowel disease. That sort of leads to another question that has come in, and we're gonna talk about diet a little bit more, but this question, um, someone called in and said that they're having excessive mucus discharge in their bowel movements, and could that be indicative of inflammatory bowel disease, or could that be caused by something else? Sure. So, um, mucus discharge in the colon, uh, from the colon, from the from the uh, anal canal, um, that can occur 
sometimes as a, a, an indication of a disease process, or sometimes that can be a, a, something that just occurs because the colon does make mucus. That's part of what helps get stool out of the colon is a, a little bit of a lubricant that's made from the lining of the colon to kind of help get the stool to pass through the anal canal a little bit easier. Um, patients with IBS, with irritable bowel syndrome, can sometimes have mucus discharge because their colon is a little bit more sensitive to the things that are inside of it. And when the colon is making normal mucus, the colon doesn't want to hold on to it if you have IBS and you can actually pass. It'll stimulate the urge to have a bowel movement, but when you have the bowel movement, it's just mucus. So it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a pathologic process that's there. It absolutely could be indicative of inflammatory bowel disease, but generally, if it's something like ulcerative colitis, in addition to the mucus, you should see some blood in the stool, generally. Mm -hmm. and, and Crohn's disease would generally, if you're having enough inflammation in the colon to cause mucus to come out from the inflammation, you would expect to see a little bit of blood with that also. Some people with internal hemorrhoids can actually have some mucus that just uh, comes out of the colon periodically also. Um, so it's, it doesn't mean absolutely that you have inflammatory bowel disease. Could be a symptom, but it could also be in, indicative of other things. Probably still something you should have checked absolutely, out. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're having it, it's a frequent problem. Uh, um, you absolutely want to uh, talk to someone about that. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's it something dire. It doesn't mean you have something terrible. That's right, that's right. So it's always good to have something checked out. And as we kind of briefly discussed before, if you're having concerns, even if you've been diagnosed, if you don't feel like the treatment is really working for you, go back, mm -hmm. continue working with your doctor because there are other things you can try to try and get your symptoms under control. And that's really what it's all about is managing the symptoms. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, well, managing the symptoms and, and getting the inflammation cured when you have that, uh, when you have ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, you, get, you have to get that inflammation cured. Are there some dietary things, once you've been diagnosed with either Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, are there some dietary restrictions, or some things you should avoid, some things that you should maybe do more of to sure. try and help keep it under control? Yeah, so uh, diet has been studied a lot in inflammatory bowel disease and whether there are specific diets that can either help when you're having flares or, or help to keep the disease into remission. And there's something called elemental diets where they're easier to digest proteins that generally come in a, a liquid form that can either be used solely as your diet or as an adjunct to some of the other things that you're taking in your diet um, that have shown to have some benefit, been known to, sh to have some benefit, um, although they're very hard to do. An elemental diet is just not something that's very palatable for patients, nor is it a lot of fun for fun. patients because you take away all the real food that, that they would normally eat. But especially in Crohn's disease, some people are very sick and they have to take time away from getting a regular diet in to let their bowel rest and heal. And sometimes in ulcerative colitis, you have to do the same thing. Um, but um, when the disease is actually under control and in remission, um, certainly for ulcerative colitis, it's a good idea to have fiber in your diet. Try to avoid fat. Lactose products can make your symptoms a little bit worse in some instances, and so you want to try to limit your lactose intake, uh, dairy product uh, intake. Um, with Crohn's disease, sometimes fiber can be a bad thing because if you have scarring mm -hmm. in, the, in the bowel from the Crohn's disease, which can occur because that's the type of inflammation that can occur. Remember me telling mm -hmm. you earlier that Crohn's disease can involve all the layers of the colon and because right. it can involve all the layers of the colon, the muscular layer in the colon or in the small intestine can, can scar down and constrict and you can develop something called a stricture and when you have that uh, the fiber in the diet can be problematic and sometimes you have to eat more of a low residue diet uh, in that sort of instance. Uh, there's been a particular diet that's um, gained a lot of interest here lately uh, um, and called the specific carbohydrate diet 
that uh, some have touted is a, a good diet to consume when you have inflammatory bowel disease um, because it will reduce the amount of carbohydrates that are being presented to the GI mm -hmm. tract and will actually um, help reduce, in, it's in theory, help reduce inflammation because some of the bacteria that's in your gut that can be pro-inflammatory and might be contributing to mm -hmm. some of the changes of inflammatory bowel disease will take on certain carbohydrates and digest them and increase inflammation. But in this particular type of a diet, there is less uh, presentation of hmm. those bad carbohydrates to those bacteria and therefore it's it's touted as helping with inflammation. I, I don't think it's been well studied. It's a hard diet to do because it's very, very restrictive, but it's something that's starting to get looked at and we are starting to look more at diet with mm -hmm. inflammatory bowel disease and whether or not there are things that we can do to try to keep the disease under control. Maybe in some instances prevent it. We just don't have anything concrete yet. So. Right, there's still an awful lot, lot. to learn about yeah. it. Oh yeah. Yeah, so, very much so. Which makes it a little bit tricky because yeah. if you're still learning about it, then it always makes it so you're, you're continually trying new things. You're yeah. always trying to do something a little bit different. Yeah, I mean, patients know what's, what types of foods, individual patients know what types of foods will make their symptoms worse. And in general, the rule of thumb is when you have certain triggers, you should avoid those triggers. And, uh, and, um, you know that's sort of the relatively of the straightforward yeah. if it makes you feel bad then you probably shouldn't, shouldn't eat it, it very shouldn't often it. especially if you have one of the conditions that you know yeah. if, if significant flare-ups are going to happen and you do have flare-ups from time to time if it's not really well in control that's right and it's time for us to wrap up they're telling us so thank you all so much for joining us it's been a very informative program dr dobbin of course it's great to have you. you please join us again next month we love having you with us when we're here for Health Talk.